This is part five of the individual training design series. This is the last one. Today we are gonna to talk about exercise sequencing, which is where we put everything together in one training session. We've talked about volume, we've talked about exercise selection and execution, assessing somebody first, we've talked about intensity, we've talked about progression, we've talked about periodization, we've talked about all the big rocks, but we haven't laid out the skeleton of your workout. When you actually go to the gym, what do you do and how do you do it? You know what exercises to do. You know what reps and sets work. You know the volume you need to hit. You know how to progress over weeks and months. But what do you actually do in that session? How do you progress throughout the session? How do you sequence things to make sure you are managing fatigue, lowering risk of injury and joint pain, and actually successfully accomplishing pro, uh, progressive overload? versus going to the gym knowing you have to progressively overload, but you're too gassed out from your training or your joints hurt so you can't add weight to the bar. That's what we're gonna talk about today. This is something I am very passionate about. This is something I talk about a lot because if you stimulate growth through volume, if you pick the right exercises, to me, this is the next thing that is super, super important to make sure that you can consistently create tension properly in the muscle and consistently hit the volume in your training sessions. Long-term periodization doesn't even matter to me if you don't have this locked down. This is a foundational step inside of my program design in the elite and with my individual clients that I work with. It's also something that I teach a lot of the mentor clients I work with and it's something I've talked about in my content quite a bit. Very, very passionate about this and I think you're gonna see why because it just makes so much sense and it makes your programs and your day-to-day -day workouts so much more effective. So the first thing on this list, now. We should probably define exercise sequencing. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's how you sequence your exercises. Pretty basic, right? If we have one program, if we have an upper body day or a lower body day or a full body day, it's the order of operations. What do you do when you start? When you walk in the gym, what is the first thing you do? Once you successfully do that, what comes next? Why do you do that next? What comes after that and why? When do you add to that? What's more important and what's optional? And that's what we're going to cover today. So the first thing we're going to do when we get to the gym is pretty obvious, a dynamic warm up. If you go to the gym and you are not warming up, preparing your core temperature and your joints to lift, probably gonna get hurt. If you get hurt, you can't lift. If you can't lift, we can't progressively overload and we can't get better, we can't get bigger, we can't get stronger, we can't get leaner. So we have to warm up before we do anything. It's something I hate doing because it's so boring to me, but when I get in the gym, I know I have to do it because if I don't, I'm gonna get injured like I have in the past and it's gonna cause me to have to take myself away from the gym. And if I'm not in the gym, I'm not making gains. And that's the biggest key factor here. Suffer through it, I know it's boring, but spend at least five minutes when you go in there just warming up. There's a couple things I will add to this. The first one that's not on here is your core temperature. It's been known forever. You gotta get your core temperature up. That's just gonna allow you to actually stimulate and perform the exercise. It's gonna be safer. Your body's alertness and readiness is just higher. So the best thing to do in my opinion is to either hit the bike, stationary bike, or an incline treadmill or an elliptical. I would choose the stationary bike or the elliptical over incline walking, but that works too. The point is, is I'm moving. With an elliptical, I'm moving my arms and, and my legs. With a bike, I'm typically moving my, just my legs. If you have an assault bike, that works too. A rower would work. But jump on some kind of cardio equipment for three to five minutes. It does not need to be a long time. You should not be huffing and puffing, but you should be breathing a little bit harder. You shouldn't be drouched in sweat, but maybe you have a couple dribbles of sweat on you. The point is, I'm warmed up. You are heating your core temperature up, and that's the whole point there. Three to five minutes there. Next, you're going to go to trigger points and mobility. Trigger points are going to be used through lacrosse balls or foam rollers, but I don't want you to spend too much time on this. The studies have shown this conclusively. Foam rolling is not that important. It's a very temporary thing and it's more neurological than anything. Maybe even placebo, but it's not at all it's cracked up to be. However, if you use them for trigger points or a lacrosse ball, which is even harder and better, then we get something out of that. Now, just as a general piece of advice, if we look at the body, there are certain parts that are like spider webs of fascia. Our shoulder and our hip are two good examples of that. On our shoulder, we have our tricep, our lateral delt, medial delt, anterior delt, posterior delt. We have um, our traps, we have our rhomboids, we have our low traps, we have our lats, we have our serratus anterior, our pec minor, all these things coming into the shoulder joint. 
It's just tons of tendons, muscle tissues, all these things. It's most likely you're going to have trigger points or knots in those places. Are they really knots? We don't know, but you do get triggered up there. And if you're triggered up there, you are tighter and have less mobility in the joint to move it. So what we wanna do is just stimulate a neurological response to it by triggering that muscle. Getting on a foam roller, getting on a lacrosse ball, and just rolling back and forth briefly, going up and down, side to side, moving your joint through the ranges of motion while having a trigger point, usually in that rear delt area, so you can just move around it. It loosens things up and it removes a trigger point. Your hip is the same thing. Glute, quad, hip flexor, TFL, psoas, all these things come into one area. So getting on those trigger points where you feel the trigger point, and rolling just a little bit just to release some tension neurologically will relieve some stress, relieve some tension, and allow you to have better range of motion because you're more flexible throughout exercises. For this, literally spend 30 seconds to a minute in each place. So you'll be doing it for a few minutes and you're done. We've warmed up on the elliptical or cardio machine. We've done the trigger points. Now we're gonna go to mobility. This is very individual, but in general, people should work on this. So if you can work on your ankles, your hips, your thoracic spine, and your shoulders, I think you're gonna be a-okay. You don't need to do too much more than that. If you have a problem area, like for myself example, I just had knee surgery. So I'm doing a little bit more movements with my knees and hips because I know that's my problem area. But if you don't have any injuries, the best thing to do is work your ankle mobility, work some hip mobility, rotational stuff for your thoracic spine, extension stuff for your thoracic spine, and then just a little overhead reach, maybe with some internal external rotation of your shoulder. So just going overhead, going in front of you, going to the side, and working internal external range of motion. Going through the movements of that joint is the biggest key here, because when you load it and you try to press heavy weight with it, now you're functionally moving through a full range of motion instead of being stiff, tight, and not able to move through a full range of motion. Studies show there's more muscle growth done and happening when we move their mu the muscles through a full range of motion. But our joints are the vehicle for our muscles to grow. They are the vehicle for our muscles to move. So if we want to take our muscles through a full range of motion, the full stretch shortening cycle where we can lengthen a muscle and contract a muscle, we have to have good mobility, but with our joints in order to accomplish that. So first things first, we warm up, we prepare. This really should take less than 10 minutes. Jump on an elliptical or a cardio machine for three to five, do a trigger point for two to four, and then spend a little bit of time, five to 10 at max if you're injured, doing mobility. Less than 15 minutes and you are golden. The next thing we're gonna do is prime. This is similar to a warm up, but it's a little bit more exciting, a little bit more fun because you're actually contracting muscles you are gonna be working the supporting muscles, and as an optional thing, you're gonna stimulate the CNS, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But the most important one here is supporting muscles. For a long time, it has been known, uh, a technique used is pre-fatiguing. People talk about pre-fatiguing as a way to stimulate tension in a muscle before you lift. So the idea was, let me do some flies or pec deck machine, get blood flow and oxygen into my chest, I feel this pump and tension, and then I'm gonna go bench press so I keep the tension in my chest. What studies have shown is you actually fatigue yourself to a point where you can't lift as heavy. So now I've brought all this blood flow to my chest and then when I go to bench, the blood flow goes elsewhere because my chest is so fatigued it cannot handle the load. When I cannot handle the load, my total volume drops and now my volume is lower and so hypertrophy comes down. So if you wanna build your triceps, do pec flies before bench because your triceps are gonna take over. You're not gonna be able to lift as heavy, but your triceps are gonna do more work during a bench press if you pre-fatigue the chest prior. So what are we talking about with supporting muscles? Before a bench, I might do some face pulls, some rows, some lat pull downs. I'm gonna do something to fire my posterior chain, my traps, my rear delts, my lats. That is going to support my bench press. When I'm benching during the negative, Everything on the posterior chain is what is allowing me to row the bar into me. It's allowing my scapula to stay supported and strong through that movement pattern. So rather than fatiguing my chest, I wanna fatigue my back so that I'm supported to bench heavier. If I can bench heavier, my volume is greater. If my volume is greater, I accomplish more hypertrophy, right? So another good example of this, during a squat, I'm gonna fatigue my hamstrings, not my quads. Quad, uh, squat is a quad dominant movement. But if I go into a squat with primed and pumped hamstrings, I'm gonna get more range of motion, I'm gonna get deeper, my knees are gonna have more support, and most likely, I'm probably gonna be able to get a little bit more torque in external rotation of my hip. To take that even a step further, I might do a side plank, a pile off press, or some kind of anti-rotation, so resisting rotation. 
when I do that, I create more ability to externally rotate my hip. So when I go in a squat, now my hamstrings are priming my knees, my side planks were uh, supporting my external rotation to get in a deeper squat with more support on my knees. So I don't get that buckle, that valgus knee. So for a squat, I'm gonna hit side plank and hamstring curls. For a deadlift, I might hit a glute bridge and a, a lat pull down or a pull in. Fire my lats, fire my glutes, now I'm supported during a deadlift. Fire my hamstrings, fire my obliques, now I'm supported for a squat. Fire my redels, fire my lats, now I'm supported for a bench. So supporting muscles is getting a pump in the muscles that are gonna support the joints moving through the compound lift. That comes next. Now if we're talking about priming our CNS, this is really important for athletes, elderly individuals, or people who are not training in a low rep zone. So I'm gonna go through those real quick. For an athlete, we need to be explosive. It's in the athletic nature. So we're gonna fire the CNS by doing throws, jumps, leaps, sprints. Anything explosive, short duration of time. Five to 15 seconds explosive maximal power output. That is going to create more force production. That is gonna stimulate my nervous system harder. Neurologically, I am going to get strength. That's a good thing. If we are tra training for athletic performance, we need that. If we are elderly, the central nervous system is basically, it, one of its prime duties is reaction time. As we get older, the likelihood of death by falling increases. The likelihood of death by any type of reaction, car accident, anything, increases. Studies show this. So what's a good way to help an elderly person or somebody who is aging get better reaction time to avoid a car crash, avoid falling down the stairs, things like that. Be explosive. I'd have 60, 70, 80 year old people doing jam ball slams and throws. I want them to move as fast as possible on command. When I say the word, they throw. Because I want to improve their nervous system ability, their neurological function and increase reaction time. For people who are training for hypertrophy and not using low rep training, I'm going to do uh, explosive work just like I did with the athlete because if we stimulate the nervous system, we're gonna recruit more motor units and muscle fibers during hypertrophy work. So if I do explosive work first for two to three sets of three to six reps, not very fatiguing, it's not a lot of crazy, but very force production dominant. I'm just trying to maximally stimulate force production and power. Then I go to that hypertrophy work in the eight, tens, and 12 rep range. I'm gonna stimulate more muscle growth for those because my nervous system is primed and ready to do so. But, if you are doing a hypertrophy program that starts with a compound lift that is three, five, or six reps, there's no need to do it. Now we're just adding volume without any reason because doing a set of three deadlifts, it's explosive enough and anaerobic enough that we're gonna get that same stimulus of the nervous system as we would doing something explosive. After we have warmed up and we have primed our body to move, we can move in the most energy fatiguing and skill demanding way and mentally focusing way. And what I mean by that is metric-based strength. These are your compound lifts. I say metric-based strength because the barbell bent row or the overhead press isn't necessarily, or the hip thrust, they're not necessarily compound lifts, but I think they can be used in place of compound lifts if they suit your body better or your goals better. And therefore we use metric-based strength as our kind of tagline for this because it's anything that is a compound or a heavy loaded lift that you are tracking progress with and keeping linear over the course of weeks and months. Meaning I'm going to do this hip thrust or this overhead press, this bent row for six reps for the next eight weeks and I'm gonna work on building strength in it and adding weight to it. That is a metric based lift. The reason this comes first is because we've warmed up and we've primed our body to do it better, but we're not fatigued yet. We have stimulated, we have not annihilated, we have activated things. Now I can lift very heavy safely and be strong with it and really progress. But if I were to put the strength lift way at the bottom, I'd be so fatigued on a muscular and joint level that I wouldn't be able to perform those heavy lifts like I want to. So with this, we are putting it at the beginning after the warm up and the priming phase because I want people to essentially be able to perform those lifts with less risk and more mental clarity and less muscular fatigue. If my muscles are more ready and not fatigued, I'm gonna be safer. If my mindset is ready to do it more, I can perform the skill better because it takes focus to do a barbell squat or deadlift. And if my general physique and body is just primed and not annihilated, I can actually execute all the reps at the highest load potential possible. Again, if I put this after all the isolation work and curls and all those things, I just wouldn't be able to lift as heavy and my volume would suffer and that's a big key for hypertrophy. 
So we've gone through the warm up, we've gone through the priming phase. Now we've done our metric based strength lifts, which are heavier compound movements. Next, we're gonna do our accessory work. These should be metric based as well, but you don't need to stick with them as long. So if your accessory work for the squat is a dumbbell lateral step up, you might not wanna stay with that for 12 weeks like you will with your heavy squat. You might switch that every three to four weeks, but it's still something that you are doing for multiple weeks in a row to try to progress over time week to week. But these accessory movements are exercises that build your compound. So if I do a squat and when I'm in the hole, at the bottom of the squat, that's my weak point. That means when my hip is in maximal flexion and my glute is in maximal stretch position, that's where I'm weakest. So what am I gonna do? I'm going to do a step up on a high box, meaning the box is high enough to where I put my leg in that position where my glutes are stretched, my hip flexors are flexed and shortened, and I'm gonna build strength there. So I'm gonna do step ups with a high platform. That's gonna help me improve my squat. If my bench press suffers at the lockout, I might do push downs or dips or close grip bench because I need to build my triceps to help me lock out my elbows at the top of the movement. The point with this is simple. When we get done with the metrics based lift, we go to the accessory work that helps us improve our compounds because the compounds are the big boulders. Those are the things that are gonna give us the biggest bang for our buck. And if we can help our body get better at those, we're winning. This does not take as much mental focus, does not, it's not as risky. Usually you can drop weights or bail or fail a lift and be a little bit safer than you could with a bar on your back or lifting off the ground. Um, it doesn't take as much mental focus, skill, energy, fatigue, joint issues don't happen as much. It's just a safer all around thing. And because of that, we're gonna put it afterwards. But it still becomes next and before the rest because it is very important and we do not wanna to be too fatigued before we do it. The next thing is optional. So these last two points have a star around it. This means we could stop before we get here and we would be fine. If you did the warm up, the priming phase, the metric based strength, and you did accessory work, you are moving towards better strength, better hypertrophy, and better body composition. But if you have the time, which most people do, I would add one of these, and if you're on a fat loss phase, possibly both. Isolation work comes first because your fat loss should come from your diet. So if you are relying on finishers and metabolic conditioning to promote fat loss, but you're not watching your diet, I think you're doing things ass backwards. What we should be doing is isolation work first. So isolation work is just gonna be extra volume. If I want to build my arms, I'm gonna do curls. If I wanna build my arms, I can do tricep extensions. I can build my shoulders with la uh, lateral raises. I can do shrugs, I can do rows, I can do lunges, I can do presses, like whatever I wanna build, flies, glute bridges, hip abductions, your muscles for that day that you want to improve, this is where you place that. So on an upper body day, I'm probably gonna do lateral raises, some kind of shrug or row variation for upper back, and then I'm gonna do some curls. These are things that really take very minimal thought process or skill. Shrugs are easy, curls are easy. I can't progress them over time very much, nor does it really matter. I just wanna create tension and do them safely. I'm not trying to PR my bicep curl, or my shrug, or my lateral raise. I'm trying to deliver blood flow and tension to the muscle. So I don't care too much about metrics on this. I don't care if the variation changes week to week or every other week. All I care about is that I have enough time to get extra volume because we know volume is the key to growth and volume is the key to muscle maintenance during the cut. If we still have time and we are watching our diet and we're focusing on all the big rocks that we need to, we can add in metabolic conditioning at the very end for fat loss. This would be uh, something like the assault bike at the end of a leg day, which for example is what I'm doing in my current cut. Two to three days a week I train legs. On those days at the end, just recently, we added six intervals at 15 seconds on, 45 seconds off on the assault bike. It takes me six minutes, gets my heart rate up, gets blood flow in my legs, creates lactic acid. It's a good fat burner, quote unquote, to just expend more calories throughout the day and throughout the week. It's a great way to go. However, this comes after all this. This is the most draining mentally. I don't want to do it. It's fatiguing and it leaves me out of breath. There's no way in hell I'm gonna go squat or deadlift after doing that. There's no way in hell I'm gonna lunge or step up after doing that. So I save it for the end because it takes zero thought process, but it's very fatiguing. So I put it at the end when I'm already somewhat fatigued and I just need to burn through it to burn extra calories. And if your goal isn't fat loss, you don't even put it there. You add more isolation work because your goal is to build muscle. All right guys, so this is the skeleton of every workout you should follow. If you're doing upper body, it could be Mobility for your upper body, priming could be face pulls and some kind of bottoms up kettlebell press to create stability in your shoulder. 
Then for metric base lifts, I might do a bench press over an overhead press and a bent row or a pull down, let's say. Accessory work might be single arm press with a single arm row and then isolation might be curls and lateral raises. And if I'm trying to stimulate fat loss and I have time, maybe I throw some battle ropes in at the end. For a leg day, we might do a lower body mobility session. Our priming might be leg curls and side planks. Our metric based movement might be a heavy squat. Our accessory work might be a hip thrust or an RDL. Our isolation, if we're gonna do it, might be hip abductions, single leg RDLs, pull throughs, something high rep, something that creates stimulus but isn't very central nervous system fatiguing. And if I'm in a fat loss phase, I might throw some kettlebell swings or an assault bike at the very end for some Metcon. But if you follow the sequencing and you literally program this way per workout, you are gonna prime your body, you're gonna get your muscles ready, you're gonna get your joints ready, you're gonna improve your big lifts to get stronger over time, which leads to more volume and more growth. You're gonna hit the right accessory movements to keep your compounds safe, healthy, and stronger. You're gonna build muscle through isolation work and you can throw in some optional phases to stimulate more of whatever you're trying to uh, stimulate or succeed with. But the point being, this is your skeleton. Warm up, prime, me uh, metric based strength, accessory work, isolation, metabolic conditioning. If you put every workout in like this for your clients or for yourself, you are managing fatigue, you are managing your focus, and you are getting better and better every time. All right, guys, that is part six. That is the final episode. If you like this series, make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube or on iTunes, wherever you're listening to this or watching this. If you want more free content of everything we put out, check out boomboomperformance.com.